Welcome. Hi, my name is Beth Novak. This is the continuation of data analytical thinking. In the last module, we covered how data can be used to define public problems. Now we will apply a process for using this skill and identify the key risks when using data. Okay, so how do we, especially if we're not trained data scientists, think about using data to define the problem better? How do we define our question? How do we identify what data is available to us? How do we draw inferences from that data that we can rely on? The three-step process that we're going to go through is a way of applying data to define the problem better. First, we're going to define the hypothesis. Then we're going to identify and find the data to validate that hypothesis or disprove it. And then we're going to choose a method of analysis. OK, let's talk about defining the hypothesis. As we learned in the module on problem definition, we can formulate a hypothesis based on our statement of the problem. A hypothesis is merely a proposition which can be put to test to determine its validity. It is a testable suggestion that something is caused by something else. In this case, we want to test that the problem is caused by the stated root causes as outlined in your problem definition. We have previously talked to relevant audiences to ascertain if the hypothesis expressed in the problem statement is true, but we can also use data to prove or disprove our definition of the problem. We can frame the problem definition we already have as a hypothesis by writing down why we think the problem is happening. Our hypothesis may be that children are skipping school because their parents are taking them off season on holidays to Disney World, if you recall our earlier example. Or maybe our hypothesis is that there are not enough cabs on the street when work lets out because there's a financial incentive for cabbies to change shifts at that time. Perhaps we have a hypothesis that unemployment is increasing because robots are replacing workers. We might hypothesize that the rate of starting new businesses is decreasing because interest rates are increasing and the cost of capital is going up. Often the hypothesis includes a theory of change about the best way to solve the problem. Perhaps our hypothesis is that we're going to improve healthcare by spending more on preventive medicine, such as annual checkups, than on after-the-fact procedures, because the root cause of poor health is a lack of attention to diet. This problem definition defines the problem in a way that gets at the underlying behavioral hypothesis about which behaviors lead to better health. In Chicago, for example, when they developed the city's data-driven project to solve the problem of foodborne illnesses that we discussed earlier, they defined the goal of the project as changing how they inspected restaurants to increase the speed of finding critical violations in an effort to prevent them from recurring. Regardless of whether we include the theory of change in our definition or not, ensuring that we have defined a specific and actionable problem is essential to take the next step namely identifying what data to use to test the hypothesis. It can, of course, be challenging to define a hypothesis without initial background research. When one is not aware of or knowledgeable about the relevant data, it can be difficult to even formulate the question. For example, coming up with a hypothesis about preventive medicine depends first on knowing the statistics about preventable diseases and the relationship between diet and morbidity. The process of determining the hypothesis is iterative and often needs to be revisited after data has been gathered and analyzed. The next step, though, in our process is then to identify the data needed to answer the question and validate the hypothesis. There are mountains of data waiting to be discovered and used for social good. Generally speaking, there are some sources of reliably available data in the United States. These include spending data at the local, state, and federal level, federal grant and contract data, along with census data. Crime, housing, and utility data are prevalent, and we'll talk a lot more about this in the next module. You may need to take advantage, however, of the Freedom of Information Act to demand data that should be open and is not. For example, in 2013, transparency activist Carl Malamud began coordinating an effort to use FOIA to force the IRS to publish nonprofit tax returns. Malamud used FOIA to request nine nonprofit tax returns from the IRS because the agency would not make the returns available in digital form. Although disclosure of nonprofit returns is required by law and the flyers, sub filers submitted those returns electronically, the IRS wanted to send Malamud image files of the returns. The IRS typically took electronically filed tax returns, printed them out, scanned them back in, 
and then sold DVDs with image files, which are not processable by a computer. But because of his successful lawsuit and campaign, the IRS not only turned over its Malamud's nine requested returns in a digitally readable format, but soon thereafter began to make all electronically filed nonprofit returns available for free to the public as open data. Alternatively, when the data is not available, you may need to gather it through your own means, through a survey, a crowdsourcing exercise, or using a citizen science mechanism. One such citizen science example came during the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in Japan. Distrustful of government published information, citizens began collecting data of their own using handheld Geiger counters, which was compiled, monitored, and openly shared through a project known as SafeCast. Some data, especially administrative data, may not be publicly available, but this may still be accessible to a policymaker or an accredited researcher through a data lab. Administrative data is that data that is personally identifiable information the government collects about us in the course of administering services to us, such as distributing an unemployment or disability benefit, handing out food subsidies, giving us a driver's license, booking us for a criminal act, or releasing us from prison. Third parties, such as hospitals and schools, also collect data about us that gets reported back to the government, thereby providing an additional source of such information. To make private data usable while protecting privacy, several governments have turned to the creation of so-called data labs. Data labs, also known as policy labs, are institutions with small groups of data analysts working inside of them in tandem with government agencies to make administrative data more usable for evaluation and research. And while organizations vary widely in their implementation, all of these data labs have developed some model to tap into the skills of highly ta talented data analysts and to access valuable government data sets responsibly. Fred Vulchin, for example, has for 35 years now, together with his team at the University of Chicago, worked with states to help them build what he calls research valuable data from the administrative records they maintain uh, and receive from the government. The cornerstone of his center's offerings is the Foster Care Data Archive, an associated web tool that supports access to the data needed to generate the evidence needed to support strong foster care programs. By harmonizing administrative data across jurisdictions, including states and counties, the archive makes comparative between and within state research possible for the protection of children. The harmonization strategies resolve the challenge of mixing data collected from different state agencies operating under different policy guidelines into a coherent and integrated framework. Okay, there are three things to check off the list when validating a data set. First, make sure that the data comes from the most authoritative source. If you need census data, get it directly from the Census Bureau. If you need student test scores, go directly to your Department of Education or national testing bodies. Second, take a look at the data and make sure that it passes a basic sniff test. Does this data make sense based on what I know about the problem? Third, try and triangulate the data to verify its accuracy. Triangulation essentially means that we're going to use more than one method to collect data on the same topic or look at two similar data sets. This is a way of reassuring the validity of research through the use of a variety of methods and sources to collect data on the same topic which may involve different types of samples, as well as different methods of data collection. Thus, try to find another source for the same information and compare. To answer your research question and investigate your problem definition, you may also need to combine data from a number of sources. Remember our Chicago restaurant example? Well, in Chicago, to develop the city's improved way of inspecting restaurants, city officials self-evidently started with an analysis of the city's historical data on food inspections to predict which establishments were more likely to reoffend. But then they ultimately looked at a whole host of factors, including three-day average high temperature, nearby garbage and sanitation complaints, nearby burglaries, whether establishments have a tobacco or alcohol license the length of time since the last inspection, the length of time the establishment has been operating, and also who the inspector was. Going outside your organizational silo and talking with people across different programs and departments to help identify and find data is key to understanding what data is going to be relevant to the problem and where it can be found. 
Okay, next we have to focus on doing the analysis. Once the data is defined and we've identified where to find it, then comes the step of deciding what kind of analysis we actually need to do. One of the most straightforward things to be done with data is simply counting. In the age of big data, we may be counting more things and doing so faster with the aid of a computer, but in the end, a great deal of research involves nothing more than tallying to gain insight. Sociologist Matt Salganik points to a piece of research involving New York City taxi data. That taxi data really pays off. A 2014 study by his, 2014, by his Princeton economics colleague, Henry Faber, used that taxi data to answer a fundamental question, namely whether, on days on which cab drivers could earn more, did taxi drivers actually drive more, consistent with what one is, would assume from neoclassical economics. Alternatively, would the data reveal, consistent with the assumptions of behavioral economics, that drivers would simply seek to earn a certain amount and beyond that amount, cease to drive. In fact, drivers did choose to drive more, although the conclusion is extremely important in terms of its validation of neoclassical theories, all that Faber did was to simply add up taxi driver earnings. Natural experiments are another source of useful insight that rely on observation without the need to design a fancy experiment or build a new algorithm. In a natural experiment, we look for an event that is naturally occurring, but that points up societal differences from which meaning can then be gleaned. So, for example, in 2001, Norwegian tax records became easily accessible online, and everyone's income suddenly became transparent. That made it possible to draw comparisons between income groups. So, UCLA economist Ricardo Perez Truglia use the income data, along with survey data from 1985 to 2013, to test whether transparency, which allowed people to see a wealth gap that had previously been hidden, impacted people's happiness and satisfaction. He found that transparency made the rich more satisfied and the poor less satisfied with their lot in life, with implications for the policy debate on tax transparency. Natural experiments can be very helpful for policymakers as they generally rely on already gathered data and they limit the need for original research or constructing designed experiments. Okay, the third possibility is to think about a randomized control trial. While not always feasible, the gold standard in terms of analysis is the randomized control trial or the RCT. An RCT involves taking a population, such as a group of schools or hospitals, and dividing the group into two parts, with one half receiving an intervention program or a treatment, and another not receiving it. As with a natural experiment, the researcher studies the resulting differences. However, the intentional sorting of the population into two or more groups is what distinguishes the RCT. This is what we commonly do in medical science when we give half the patients the drug and the other half the placebo. If we observe a statistically significant difference while holding other factors constant, then we can attribute success to the social program. Randomized control trials provide a scientific approach to assessing the efficacy of social programs and taking the ideological guesswork out of the process. As we discussed in our first module, machine learning is the science of teaching computers to learn. When used for data analysis, machine learning offers a powerful new means for both spotting problems and for solving them. For example, the Rockefeller Foundation has partnered with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa and Atlas AI to fund a predictive analytics project to anticipate damage to uh, crops with the ultimate goal of improving food security across sub-Saharan Africa. Using satellite imagery, Atlas AI has trained a machine learning algorithm to study crop growth <clears throat> in relation to changing weather, diseases, and pests. By predicting perturbations in agricultural production, it can help government and philanthropy both to anticipate and to prevent losses and to target interventions. Okay. At every stage of the data life cycle, from data collection to data processing to data analysis to data use, there are risks. We'll cover some of the key ones here and talk in our next module further about how to mitigate them. Real-world problems are often complex and very multidimensional. Over-reliance, therefore, on any single method of analysis can be fraught with danger. Using different methods of analysis 
and multiple data sets related to the problem can help mitigate this risk. As we stated at the outset too, relying only on data analysis of one kind without talking to and learning from humans gives us a one-sided view of the problem. We must do both. Often the data we're using is incomplete. If I'm trying to measure a popular sentiment, for example, on an issue using Twitter, I'm only measuring the sentiment of those people who use Twitter. The elderly, the poor, the homeless, and others who are not big users of social media may go undercounted. Also, we are often failing to collect the right data. U.S. federal crime data is a good example of how certain data is collected while other relevant data is ignored. Although the FBI collects, publishes, and makes available for downloading the Uniform Crime Reports estimated monthly aggregates of the instances of eight major crimes, including murder, rape, assault, robbery, arson, burglary, larceny, theft, and motor vehicle theft. We have no similar data store for white-collar crime. The existence or non-existence of data, therefore, ends up changing our policy priorities. Thus, we must pay very careful attention to what's missing. The problem extends beyond the public sector, too. Gartner estimates that 25% of Fortune 1000 companies have information on hand that is inaccurate, incomplete, or duplicated. Okay. Data conveys a sense of impartiality and infallibility. Machine learning algorithms, for example, are sometimes introduced to reduce human forms of bias in decision making. But there is no such thing as unbiased data or unbiased algorithms or unbiased machine learning that makes impartial decisions. A machine learning algorithm learns from historical data that it has been trained on, and thus biased inputs will lead to biased outputs. It's far too easy to make mistakes when doing data analysis. We make mistakes when looking at data by drawing conclusions that are not supported by the facts at hand. P-hacking, or data dredging, is the problem of inferring statistically significant findings in data where none exists. Ideally, one defines the research question and the hypothesis prior to analyzing the data to prove or disprove the claim. If the first hypothesis does not bear out, however, we might try to analyze the same data differently looking for a new hypothesis. While we are not social scientists looking for the perfect experiment, we have to take care not to keep digging and poking simply to find something, to find anything that causes the data to fit the problem. Establishing data responsibility principles, processes, and tools to ensure that data is shared, analyzed, and used responsibly and ethically helps to ensure that insights can be gained without harming individuals and groups. You'll find plenty of worksheets and toolkits on the website to help you further with this process. Ultimately, the greatest data risk, however, is the failure to use data to solve public problems in the first place. Data is playing an increasingly important role in solving big public problems, primarily by allowing citizens and policymakers access to new forms of data-driven assessment of the problems at hand. It also enables data-driven engagement producing more targeted inventions and enhanced collaboration. However, IBM estimates that 80% of the data we collect goes unused. In Europe, that number is 85%. Beth Blauer tells a story of her time leading the StateStat performance management team for Maryland, a story that starkly illustrates the danger of failing to use data, whether for legal, cultural, or technical reasons. She talks about the time that she met with juvenile justice agencies, as well as social service agencies and public safety agencies. They were talking about their most violent and dangerous offenders in the state, and she asked a very innocent question. How often are the agencies in Maryland talking to foster care locations? In other words, the registered statewide foster care locations, and comparing that data with the data on violent and dangerous offenders, and matching those addresses. What she thought was a very innocent question turned out to be a very serious problem because the answer was that no one was using the data. People thought there was a legal prohibition to exchanging information interagency. But as it turned out, that so-called prohibition was in fact just a custom, just the practice that people thought they couldn't share data. And as a result, they were placing children at risk. When they actually overlaid the violent offender data and the foster care data, they were able to identify exactly where the children were located and within one week remove them from dangerous conditions. As we can see, combining data with human-centered and participatory approaches 
is a powerful way to solve public problems. We look more closely at one of the most important sources of data, that is open data, in our next module. Thank you.